Hey, and welcome back to Heimler's History. Now, anyone who knows me knows I love Disney World. Love is not strong enough a word. I love it. I loaf it. And sometimes my students don't believe me when they find out that I love Disney World that much. Because I spend my whole life dealing with the complex, philosophical, theological, historical complexities of life. And I do my absolute best to present those complexities and all their wonder to my students. So when they find out that I go gaga over Disney parks, they get a little skeptical. And the reason why they're skeptical is because Disney Disney parks, on their surface at least, seem like the very opposite of everything serious and transcendent in this world. In a lot of people's minds, Disney parks are the place you go to escape reality for a while, to ride some rides, mindless entertainment. But the point of this video is to show you that I think Disney parks are much more than that. And in order to see exactly what that something is, and in order to understand why people from all over the world flock in the millions to these parks every year, and maybe most of all to explain why for people who love these parks, there is something about them that is deeply affected when they arrive on Main Street USA. I'm going to give you a history of the idea of Disney parks. And what I hope that you'll see through this is that Disney parks aren't just the place we go to pass some hours, to have some mindless entertainment, to ride some rides and dump a bunch of money, but that these parks are actually the embodiment. In fact, this is how Walt Disney intended it when he designed them. They are the embodiment of what is most transcendent in our lives. Mm, I got chills. All right, let's get started. Now here at the outset, it's going to be very important for you to understand the larger historical context into which Walt Disney conceived of and gave us the first of his parks, Disneyland. So the planning and execution of Disneyland happened between 1947 and 1955. And during these years, America had just emerged victorious from World War II. The economy was booming, unemployment was low, and there was a general sense of triumph and ease around the country. But almost as soon as the sun began to shine on our fair nation, a great shadow started to loom over it as well. And that's what we call the Cold War. For many reasons beyond the scope of this video to explain, the United States and her former ally Russia became locked in a giant arms race. And this created a decades-long standoff that at any moment could send hundreds of nuclear weapons across the ocean in a great morass of mutually assured self-destruction. And this is the fearful reality that Americans during that time went to work with and ate with and slept with and got married with. In fact, it was novelist William Faulkner who in his Nobel Prize lecture said this, Our tragedy today is a general general and universal physical fear so long sustained by now that we can even bear it. There are no longer problems of the spirit. There is only the question, when will I be blown up? But not only were the Russian communists threatening us from across the sea, they had made their way, apparently, into our very backyards. It was during this time that Senator Joseph McCarthy put fear into the hearts of every American, warning them that communists were in disguise everywhere. In fact, no less than President Truman's own attorney general said, communists are everywhere, in factories, in offices, butcher stores, on street corners, and in private business, and each carries in himself the death of society. And add to that general fear and anxiety, the suburbanization of America. Millions of families started moving out of the cities into this not quite urban, not quite rural environment, and people began to separate as a result of that from their larger family units. And and now there's this growing sense among the American family of dislocation and isolation. So the point of all that I've just said is this, that during this time, people felt like they had very little control over their lives and there was this deep existential crisis of meaning. Americans were wondering, who are we? Where do we belong? What does all of this mean? And what Americans needed at this moment of deep anxiety was Walt Disney. He once said, if people would think more of fairies, they would soon forget the atomic bomb. Now, Walt had already been a great comfort to the nation during the throes of the Great Depression. Americans found comfort in films like Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, Pinocchio, and Dumbo. But by 1947, Walt had grown largely bored with his films, even though he kept producing them at a phenomenal rate. And in order to relieve his boredom, he began collecting miniatures, scale model houses, trees, miniature town halls, miniature trains, and he found deep satisfaction in arranging and ordering these items into a little world into which he could transport himself when he was particularly stressed. And he said, I become so absorbed that the cares of the studio fade away, at least for a time. And eventually he created an expansive miniature town that he dubbed Disneylandia. And this little town was, for Walt, not about escaping from his life, but about the perfection 
and control of life. I mean, the rest of the world was about to blow up, but here in this little town, all was well, and under Disney's control, it would remain well. And there was something about that little town that stirred the deep longings inside of Walt's guts. And what no one knew except Walt himself was that in creating this little world, he had decided to build a life-size park grand enough to offer to the world the simulated reality that he had created in his scale models. You see, Walt loves taking his children to a merry-go-round in a park near his home. But but something wasn't right about it. As he watched the children really enjoying themselves on the merry-go-round, squealing with delight, he looked around at the parents sitting there doing nothing. And he said to a friend, there's nothing for the parents to do. You've got to have a place where the whole family can have fun. But he also found that he had another complaint when he visited larger, more robust theme parks, namely, they were dirty. And he commented to another friend, one of these days I'm going to build an amusement park and it's going to be clean. And once he finally let these ambitions out of his head, nobody who was close to him believed in it. His wife Lillian feared that he was being too ambitious and that it would fail. His brother and business partner Roy discouraged him from pursuing it on the grounds that it would be a financial disaster. But none of this had the least effect in dissuading Walt from pursuing his dream. So Walt created a separate secret division of the Disney company devoted to the development of the park. And as they began to work, Walt's imaginings for the park were teased out in all directions. And a biographer of Walt Disney, Neil Gabler said it this way, Disneyland had evolved into something much more unusual and much more grandiose. Not just a park that could provide fun and diversion, but a kind of full imaginative universe that could provide a unified experience. It was truly a land rather than an amusement park. And in the secret meetings with those who were designing the park, Walt described the park as a movie. Here is scene one, here is scene two, here is scene three. And nobody knew how to tell a story that awakened human longing and resulted in the triumph of the hero like Walt Disney. Therefore, he conceived that the centerpiece of his park would be the castle of everyone's dreams. He would build a main street that made his guests feel like they actually lived there. And in order to maintain the illusion, he would create a berm around the entire park that physically blocked out sight lines to the outside world. Walt envisioned his guests being fully submerged into a world that spoke the language of all of their deepest longings and desires. And in this way, at least it seems to me, there was something of a religious aura to Walt's vision. In a promotional brochure for Disneyland, it said, when you enter Disneyland, you will find yourself in the land of yesterday, tomorrow, and fantasy. Nothing of the present exists in Disneyland. This park was meant to offer a different kind of experience than your run-of-the-mill amusement park. Those parks were loud and chaotic, exhausting and dirty. The Disneyland of Walt's vision was to be governed by control and order, and as such it would provide comfort and rest to his guests. The layout of the park was composed of circles and loops, which Walt discovered with his iconic Mickey Mouse was the most harmonious and pleasing of shapes. Now in a book about the architecture of Disney World, Carol Ann Marling describes it as the architecture of reassurance. She argues that when you enter these parks, there is a discernible sense that there is an order governing the disposition of things. And so with all the plans moving along, Walt bought 160 acres of orange groves in Anaheim, California as the site for his new world, and he announced that the park would open a year later in 1955. Now just to be clear, nothing quite like this had ever been attempted before. In fact, one of Walt's associates said, while we were planning Disneyland, every amusement park operator we talked to said that it would fail, and Walt would come out of those meetings happier than if they'd been optimistic. Walt seemed to love the fight. He seemed to enjoy the insurmountable hurdles that he would have to jump over in order to make this a reality. And most of all, he was giddy to have the opportunity once again to prove that the impossible was possible. Now, while all this is happening, the world around Walt Disney is popping at the seams. During the year while Walt was developing Disneyland, the Supreme court handed down a historic decision in Brown versus the Board of Education. And this decision desegregated public schools, and this was met with fierce resistance and racial violence in the South. Not only that, but the Korean War was just coming to a close, and the preliminaries to the war in Vietnam were just heating up. And just one month before Walt broke ground at the Anaheim site, the country engaged in its first civil defense drill. What's a civil defense drill? Good question, me from that side of the screen. So at a certain time and on a certain day, alarms sounded in every metropolitan 
metropolitan area, and for 10 minutes everyone hid in the nearest nuclear fallout shelter. And even though we had a pretty decent performance on this, military experts in Washington estimated that 12 million Americans would have perished had it been a real nuclear attack. And this is what Americans are doing and reading about in the newspapers right before Disneyland opens. But over in Anaheim, Walt Disney was out on the work side in a straw hat and a bright sports shirt overseeing every aspect of his new world. And he himself was directing the workers. He was saying to this one, speed up, and to that one, slow down. Walt wanted perfection. He could settle for nothing less than the utopia of his dreams. And as such, the cost of this thing kept spiraling upwards. The initial project cost was about five and a quarter million dollars, but by opening day, he had spent almost 17 million dollars. And what made it so expensive? the details. For example, in order to save money on an attraction, one employee suggested using cut glass instead of stained glass. But Walt rejected such suggestions outright, saying, look, the thing that's going to make Disneyland unique and different is the detail. If we lose the detail, we lose it all. You see, Walt Disney knew what every great artist knows, namely that the human heart is not moved by generalities, but by specificities. And Walt simply would not compromise on the small things. Even the details of how guests were to pass from one land into another was meticulously planned and conceived of as a movie. So in filmmaking, there's a technique that editors use called a cross-dissolve. And you would use a cross-dissolve when you wanted one scene to fade into another without a harsh cut. One scene gradually fades away while the new scene gradually comes into view. And so the entrances to the different worlds were set up this way, so that leaving one land Land, the next land gradually emerges into view. And even the paving materials change when walking from one world into another because Walt thought that a person could know an awful lot about where they were through their feet. And it was the guest whom Walt cast as the protagonist. He wanted rides that told stories and created the feeling in his guests that, quote, good triumphs over evil. That the little fellow through a combination of good luck, courage, and cunning can always overcome in the end the big bad person in his or her numerous guises, all of which signify signify power and its abuse. And so as construction was nearing its completion, Walt knew that the final piece of the puzzle that he needed was the staff for the park. And Walt believed that these people were critical to the guests' ability to suspend disbelief and enter that world and live in it fully. And so he liked to say that he wasn't hiring for jobs, he was casting for roles. Because the actors in a movie are the crucial component to upholding the reality of the imagined world. The cast members had to believe in the world, they had to be kind to the guest and most of all happy and now with everything in place opening day for Disneyland was set for July 15th 1955 and on opening day Walt stood to greet the crowd of his guests saying to all who come to this happy place welcome Disneyland is your land here age relives fond memories of the past and here youth may savor the challenge and promise of the future Disneyland is dedicated to the ideals the dreams and the hard facts that have created America with the hope that it will be a source of joy and inspiration to all the world. Thank you. And it wasn't unusual to hear reports from friends and family that Walt would peer out from his apartment above the fire station on Main Street to observe his guests walking by. Always he would have a smile on his face, and often tears were in his eyes. Maybe in the outside world people's only question was, when will I get blown up? Maybe in the outside world everyone was anxious and fearful of a nuclear explosion. But here in the land of Walt's dreams, people walked to and fro along streets that were engineered to bring them the greatest happiness they had ever experienced. And in spite of what everybody said during the idea phase of Disneyland, it was a massive success. Millions of Americans flocked to the park over the next few years. But by 1958, just three years after Disneyland opened, Walt was already dreaming of something new. Everyone wanted to know whether he would open another theme park, and he said eventually that he would. But that wasn't the whole story. You see, Walt was not content with the faux utopia that he had created. He had in mind a real utopia. He called it Epcot, the experimental prototype community of tomorrow, and it would be a real city built into the same principles as Disneyland. It would be clean, it would be controlled, and it would be perfect. Here, people would live, people would work, people would play. And 
the latest technology will be put to use and tested for its viability on a larger scale. And so in order to realize this dream, Walt and his brother Roy began secretly buying up huge parcels of land in Central Florida. But Epcot, as Walt envisioned it, was never to be. In November of 1966, Walt was diagnosed with lung cancer, and a month later he died in St. Joseph's Hospital in Burbank, California. A few months later, Walt's team of Imagineers presented the plans for Epcot to Roy, who was running the company in his brother's absence. And they only had one question, what now? To which Roy reportedly said, Walt is dead. And that meant Epcot was dead too. But Roy did go ahead with the implementation of a new plan for a theme park in Florida, of which a reimagined Epcot would be a part. In the end, Epcot wasn't a working city, it was more of a reimagined World's Fair. And in 1971, when Walt Disney World was finally finished and opened its gates to the public, Roy Disney stood up and gave a speech of dedication to his brother's original idea, and he said this, May Walt Disney bring joy and inspiration and new knowledge to all who come to this happy place, a magic kingdom where the young at heart of all ages can laugh and play and learn together. And today we no longer live under the threat of imminent nuclear war. We no longer fear that our stores and our government and our schools are being infiltrated by communists. But we do have anxieties of our own, some arguably less important, some arguably more important. And to me, the legacy of Walt Disney to Americans and to the larger world is hard to overestimate. He left us with a place we can go that calms our sinking fears. He left us with a place we can go where we have the settled assurance that good will triumph over evil someday. And most of all, he left us with a place where we can know the sensation, at least for a moment, that all is well.